you don't really notice it, you know? I mean, you notice key things, and I think, you know, something like, you know, the first time I, I was really sat with a famous person is something, you know, that you, you kind of tell all your friends about, you know, and that, that's sort of key, those things stay with you, you know, and, you know, without a doubt, I, I look at it now and I think, you know, within our industry, I'm, pro you know, probably as well known as anybody. That, that does feel a little bit like, you know, I don't know if it feels strange or whatever, but, you know, you don't think about it along the way. You know, think, like I said, you tend to look back at it a bit and... Uh, The ones that maybe have the biggest impact are, uh, they're not necessarily to me the most inspiring, you know, and, and I, this is gonna sound awful, but, but you, you know what I mean. Like someone like a Cheryl Cole, you know, which she was wearing all our things. She wears, wears the stuff all the time. I made, she probably doesn't want to think about it now, but I made her wedding rings, engagement rings, and, and she wears our things because she chooses to. Well, that woman's on the cover of everything all of the time, you know. So does, does that have more of an impact than someone that might say, oh, my, my favourite band or whoever, you know, and, but they're hardly ever seen. Or when they are, it's going to be in the music pages of something. So, so it's sort of, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not so much about thinking that uh, the, the most inspiring people are the ones that, that are going to have the biggest impact on your business. I, I think for me, it's more of a sort of a... We, we work with a lot, a lot of celebrities, so I could probably open my BlackBerry and, and see from last night that there will be uh, one, two, might be more people that have been wearing my jewellery because it will be all over, mainly in America or, or England. So, you know, I kind of look at it. I don't react too much to it because it happens all the time. But what it does is a huge communication for our business. So, so you know, when you start looking through the books and... And, and at any point in, in the sort of the magazines, the nows, the grazias and all these, and you, you know I'm not going to open up one without seeing my product. That to me, is, it's not as controllable, <laughs> but it's like me having an advert in every, every magazine, which we couldn't do. So it's a huge, huge vehicle for us. Well, my strengths, um, I think I, I pulled now from, really from the people around me, you know, I think I... I have to say my team, you know, are amazing. You know, I've got this, these sort of people that um, they drive the business with me. And, and I think if, if, if you kind of go in and you're feeling a bit like jet lagged <laughs> or, or, or out of sorts or out of ideas or whatever, you know, you need that team because they're not all emotionally at the same place at the same time. So, so when one of them, because, you know, when you've got a creative bunch, at any point anyone can be a bit... Off, but but I think it's sort of you pull it all together. It's not just another Stephen Webster shop. It's uh, I mean it's number two Rodeo Drive, so it feels like really wow. You're right in the middle of, of of Beverly Hills, but on the top floor there was this sort of I won't say useless space, but it was it was sort of a it came part of the package because it was just offices. And I'm standing up in these offices and I'm thinking, oh my God, I mean, this view is ridiculous. I mean, one window looks straight down Wiltshire Boulevard. The other, all the windows on the side look into the Beverly Wiltshire Hotel. This side, I'm looking down Rodeo Drive. It's this big corner building. And it was just three offices. So I, I had all the walls knocked out, everything. I knocked all the ceiling out. I've exposed everything and made like a loft, which there isn't anything down there like that. And uh, I built a bar, proper bar. I called it No Regrets Lounge. And, uh, and I'm, I'm making it an art gallery. So I've got, because you know, I love m uh, modern art, like street art, like these sort of things is what I have in my house. So I've sort of made that environment up there and, and uh, it's gonna be very exciting because I've never, you know, first of all, I needed the space, but it was also this space felt right as well. And so a few artists have been up and had a look at it and they all love it. So, like, Tracy Emin's making me a piece for it, Sue uh, Webster and Tim Noble making me a piece for it. So it's going to feel like a real extension out from Stephen Webster. It's not me, I'm just curating it, you know, and, and so that's quite exciting. Yeah, um, well, my luxuries, um, you know, they've, they, have, they change, of course, because I think something 
I think Paul Smith said it, and it's really true. It's, a, it's something that's out of the ordinary for you, you know? So it might be ordinary for somebody else, but it's sort of out of the ordinary. Otherwise, it doesn't feel like it just becomes normal. So we'll have a luxury life. It's all, everything all the time. So I think uh, for the longest time, it was when I started to travel on a plane where the seat became a bed. That was like, because, you know, I kept doing these long, long flights and, uh, and get arriving sort of like, you know, and you, you, you saw right when you're 30 and then when you get 40, you get 45 and you become so, so I go, well, that was one thing. Well, that's just become normal now. I'm not going to travel anywhere unless I can lie down. Uh, I mean, for a long journey. So, so really, I think it's, uh, my indulgences are, um, after my first successful show in America, um, my wife was in England. She'd just given birth to our daughter. I was in Las Vegas because I had to be there. I'd booked to do our first show, my brother and I. I did, we did everything we could. She was induced, she was everything before I left. This baby was due, but it wasn't gonna come. So of course I fly to Vegas to do our, uh, to do our show and, uh, and then the baby's born while I'm there. So um, the fact that it was Vegas, people kind of think, oh God, how could you have been in Vegas? But I was doing this show. And, and, and after the show, I, I was, I was in, in the street and I saw a 1959 Thunderbird. I was born in 1959 and it was $6,000. So I bought it because that was, just seemed like nothing. And, uh, and I stored it. And over 10 years, I restored it. And now, sort of $66,000 later, it's, it's a really great restored American car. And I, I keep it in America. And uh, I restored it with a friend, because I needed to keep it somewhere. And, and so, so, sort of, it was a joint project in the end. And once a year, we go on the, a road trip. And, and it's just he and I. And uh, that, that means I have a lot of time to just talk with, with a friend and um, we're not doing anything. We just drive, you know, but we're in this 1959 Thunderbird and, and I just play all the music that, that I like and I still get completely excited about a certain track. I'll put it on and we get, you know, it's like Wayne's World. We get really excited about it and, and it's, it's really crazy, but, but it's, it's a complete luxury, of course it is, to be able to do that. You know, we'll do, the time on it, first, it started off on the first year as 10 days and now it's down to about five, but it's okay. Um, it's, it's just two guys. And, and I think that he and I both realise that there's not many times that you, you would get an opportunity like that. It's, it's quite different to, to go on a holiday with your family and everything, which I absolutely love, but this, this is a sort of, you said, what's well, a luxury that feels like that to me.